Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for Versin Capital Management's investment update. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy day, so let's get started. My name is Brandon Yi. I'm a research analyst here at Versin. I am joined today by Tom Connolly, Versin's president and chief investment officer. During today's presentation, we will provide an update on market returns. We'll give a brief COVID-19 update. And then we'll put the current market environment into perspective and explain how that affects your portfolio going forward. But before we begin, I have a few administrative items. First, all attendees are muted. Please use the chat feature to ask any questions or leave any comments. Chats are private and being managed by our moderator. Your questions will be addressed at the end of the meeting. And if we don't get to your questions, your wealth counselor will reach out to you in the coming days. This webinar is being recorded and a replay link will be sent out tomorrow. And if you're having connection issues while watching the webinar, you can press the reconnect button at the top of the screen. Perfect. Uh, so since we last provided an update a few months ago in April, the markets, thankfully, have rallied and we've recouped much of our losses in the first quarter. In mid-March, equity markets were down around 30% to 35%, but now through the end of May, um, the U.S. equity market was down only 4.5%. And actually, if we look past, um, over the past one year, the U.S. equity market is up. 12.79%. In the international development markets, the, those markets were down about 14%. And over the past year, they're down only 3%. And it's a similar story in the emerging markets. Those are down about 16% through the end of May and down about 5% over the past year. So an encouraging sign is that the rally is global and not just restricted to a few countries. So if we look at the one month May returns, the majority of those are positive. If we dive a little bit deeper into global sector returns, we can see a little bit more variation and also what has driven uh, some of the market rally. Uh, so information, technology, and healthcare are actually positive for the year. And those were the two sectors that really held up better in mid-March. Uh, if you think about companies like Amazon and Netflix, those companies really benefited from the stay-at-home orders. However, since mid-May, we've actually seen other parts of the market lead the rally. So financial companies and energy companies the two sectors that were hit especially hard in the first quarter have bounced back quite a bit. Um, in the energy space, we saw declines of about 60 to 70% in, in March, and now that space is down only around 35%. From a style perspective, we've seen value companies rally, and we've also seen small cap stocks rally. Um, what's important about this is that the rally is broad and it's not being led by just one sector or one reason. So that gives us an in indication that this rally may be a little bit more sustainable uh, going forward. In the fixed income universe, high quality bonds, especially treasuries, have done really well. So short-term treasuries are up about 4% through the end of May. And long-term treasuries, one of the big winners of 2020, uh, those are up about 21%. The fixed income investments with a little bit more credit risk, like high yield and leveraged loans, those are down about 6% for the year. So one important takeaway after seeing all these returns is that Thankfully, fixed income has provided some valuable diversification benefits, and as an added bonus, that has allowed us to rebalance back into other really hard-hit asset, asset classes like equities. 
So that was a quick summary on market returns. Now we can provide a quick update on COVID-19. Thank you, Brandon, and welcome everybody. And thank you for spending so much of your valuable time with us today. Uh, first, I'd like to say a, a few words about COVID uh, and where we are. The answer to that really is, uh, we know a lot more than when the pandemic started, but there is still a tremendous amount of certainty. So. Um, this is the latest modeling uh, as of a few days ago out of the University of Washington, um, and it charts daily deaths uh, in the U.S. Uh, as of a few days ago, actually. And you can see the line that uh, references today. And past that line, there's a dotted line for projection, and there's a band of uncertainty around it, which simply reflects the many things that we don't know about this pandemic as to whether or not uh, there'll be uh, a second or multiple waves, will there be a vaccine, um, so on and so forth. Um, but what we do know, so th this chart shows the uncertainty, what we do know is that in the US, uh, testing has ramped up quite a bit and we can chart the ratio of positive tests to total tests that have been taken. And that's important because uh, the, the test data is, is really the data we have. Uh, it's solid and the, and the measure of accuracy on these tests is typically very high, uh, over 99%. And we can see the dark blue line shows a steadily trend downward in the number of positive tests to total tests countrywide. However, there's a lot of variation within that. And some states are showing uptrends and so here's a chart of Arizona, where a lot of you reside. And you can see that recently, even though the number of tests have been going up, um, the number of positives have been going up as well. And Arizona is not the only state we're seeing this in. North Carolina, Florida, Utah, Texas are some others. And uh, uh, so we aren't maybe quite out of the woods on, on the pandemic yet. Uh, from on the economic stand, from an economic standpoint, uh, the activity uh, seems to be bifurcated. There are uh, record new business applications with the IRS, uh, some other manufacturing, employment, and activity in indicators are going up fairly quickly. But more of the indicators that are related to travel and entertainment, um, and some of the more cyclical businesses are are going trending up, but are still uh, down from their um, start pre-COVID. So it seems like we have some things that are recovering fairly quickly and others that are not. Uh, one of the surprising things I saw uh, was this data from JP Morgan on uh, short-term vacation rental bookings from uh, um, uh, some of the Airbnb and the um, one of the other self-reporting or self-renting internet sites and it shows that re just recently bookings uh, for short-term uh, vacation rentals have exceeded uh, pre-COVID numbers. So we do have some surprises in, in how fast things are, are going. But in the future, we really don't know how this is going to impact the economy. But I can say for sh with fair certainty that I don't think anyone is going to argue for the lockdown to the extent that we just had uh, for a number of reasons, the mortality of the disease appears to be lower than we first thought. And furthermore, it's restricted uh, to per, uh, groups that are particularly at risk. Um, and so the strategy might be uh, to try to control the spread through distancing and masks and uh, uh, other measures of, uh, of cleanliness, uh, helping segregate those more um, uh, susceptible to the disease with respect to mortality, uh, taking extra care to protect them. And um, in the trenches, the, the people on the trenches with the very ill have adopted a suite of, of protocols of treatment that don't involve new vaccines or drugs, but a combination of, of things that they've discovered can lower mortality up to 50%. So they're, in addition to vaccines that are starting trials as soon as uh, July, Johnson & Johnson just announced that this morning. Um, we have other therapeutics uh, in the works that might aid 
uh, in convalescence or reduce mortality. And some of these other steps that can be taken, I think we're going to see a combination of these things over the next year or two, rather than a, a lockdown that will take a big chunk out of the economy. Uh, with and this is a very important slide, the extent of the government uh, monetary and fiscal responses to the uh, COVID were very quick with respect to what happened in the depression in 2008 and massive in their scope and magnitude. So in the US, uh, we can see the, the dark orange or red, depending on your monitor, is the amount of direct economic decline forecast at this point. Uh, and the uh, light colored uh, of the same is second and third order effects that will uh, cause a further decline in economic activity. And you can see the fiscal and the, and the um, uh, central bank stimulus exceeds the anticip in the US exceeds the anticipated um, economic consequences uh, so far. And this doesn't count the second round of stimulus that they're debating in Congress. So maybe one of the reasons you're seeing a stock market behave like it is, is we have massive, massive fiscal and monetary stimulus pumped in very quickly. And a lot of this hasn't even hit yet. And if you go abroad um, in Europe, uh, Japan and the UK, very sizable responses, not as much as in the US or to in excess of, of the economic downturn. Um, but in another day, the, Euro the Europeans just uh, agreed in principle on an idea uh, for stimulus that will change the um, outlook for the whole European Union. It's a water, it was a watershed event, and I'll talk about that in a future event. But in any case, everybody's responded uh, with stimulus in measure that's close to the anticipated uh, magnitude of their downturns. Brandon? Yeah. Uh, so one question we've gotten a few times from clients and that we wanted to address today is what is the market? If you were to watch the financial uh, news, I imagine the market is usually implied to be either the S&P 500 or the Dow. Um, however, as investors, we should really be thinking about the investable universe and the different types of investments available to us. So this has more of a global perspective. So in addition to US stocks, we should also be thinking about international stocks. And if we're thinking about US bonds, we should also be looking at foreign bonds for investment opportunities. And then this investable universe also includes other uh, asset classes like real estate and commodities. So this slide shows the different um, markets and the size of the markets relative to each other. So if an investor was only focused on the S&P 500, he would be focusing on just the bottom left corner and those really light blue squares. Um, but that also means that he's investing, uh, he's, um, He's not looking at about 30% of the other parts of the US stock market. And that is right above the light blue squares. Um, it's a, just a little bit darker blue. So if an investor were to restrict himself to just that one index, he'd be missing out on potentially really attractive opportunities. And that's, that's just one asset class. So there's so many more uh, opportunities available to investors. And another thing to consider is if we just focused on the S&P 500, there's really no guarantee uh, that the S&P 500 will perform better than other asset classes going forward. So over the past five decades, there have actually been two decades where real returns to investors was negative. So that means really you're not seeing an increase in purchasing power. And personally, I don't think I could take 10 years of, of no returns. Um, so that's why it's important to look elsewhere too and, and think globally. To provide just a little bit more context, 
Uh, so if we think about the 500 companies and the S&P 500, those 500 companies really represent only about 3% of all the investable and listed uh, stocks in the global markets. So the U.S. alone has a little bit over 3,000 stocks um, that someone can invest in. If we go to international developed markets, there are 22 countries where we can look for opportunities and almost 7,000 stocks. And then if we go to the emerging markets, um, there are about 26 countries and about 7,000 stocks available um, to invest in. And the one thing in particular about emerging markets is that emerging markets have about 80% of the world's population and contributes over 50% of the world's GDP. It just makes up about 10 to 15% of the global stock market cap. So if we look at the rest of the universe, I imagine there's at, there are at least a few companies and people that we'd, we'd be willing to invest in. So it'd, be, it'd behoove us to uh, look outside of, of the US. And then here's another perspective um, to consider, and that is to look at how markets have changed over time. So if we start on the left-hand side, uh, that represents the global stock market in 1900. Um, so as you can see, the UK equity market composed about 25% of the global markets and the US was only about 15%. If we fast forward about 119 years, uh, that changed considerably, and we've been very fortunate. Uh, the US equity market is 53% uh, of the global stock market. So if I was a UK citizen uh, in the mid 19th century, and I was comfortable just investing in UK equities, if I ignored the rest of the world, I would have missed out on some really compelling returns um, over 100, 120 years. So in 80 years, in 21, 2100, there's really no guarantee that the US market uh, will be the biggest and provide the best returns. So that's another reason why we also need to think globally and, and stay diversified. So Tom will provide a little bit more context on what's driving the market. Thanks, Brandon. Um, the next group of slides I'm gonna try to go through fairly quickly here. And the, the gist of them is that a relatively few low number of stocks have driven the performance of the US market, um, number one. Number two, this has happened numerous times in the past, and uh, leaders over time uh, switch places. So right now, um, the first slide shows how uh, some mega cap growth stocks and they're listed, the tickers are listed below, Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, Google, Facebook, Visa, Adobe, uh, NVIDIA, um, have grown this handful of stocks uh, uh, making up uh, less than 1% of the S&P 500 are responsible for almost 27% uh, of the value of that index. And you can see how that's evolved. Just in the last 10 years, those stocks were um, uh, about 7% of, of the value of the S&P have grown to be over about 27% just in 10 years. And then you can see the, how that reflects in performance. These stocks have vastly outperformed uh, the rest of the Standard & Poor's 500. And so one might question, uh, can this continue? Because uh, at least five of these companies now are trillion dollar companies. And bear in mind that the size of the US economy before COVID uh, is about 22 trillion. So each company of those companies is one twelfth the size of the US economy. Um, and so, uh, the S&P concentration is the most ever, even 
above what it was in the tech bubble. And you can go back in time to any of the other periods um, in history and you'll find that that's the case. And if you look at those big stocks on the right, just the value of them, of four of them, exceeds every stock market value, the value of every stock market in the world, save that of Japan and the US without them. Uh, and so we, this, is, this is truly an extraordinary event um, that's happened here, uh, not just in the last year, but in the last 10 years. And it's not, uh, we need to ask ourselves, is, is this, can this continue? So the, the battle between those stocks and the have nots, um, uh, over the last 10 years, you can see here, this is from a Wall Street Journal article, um, that the growth stocks have outperformed the rest of the market a lot. Many of the years over the previous 10 and the return disparity in co the COVID period was massive because as Brandon pointed out, uh, the rest of the market or value stocks, so to speak, which make up a big part of that, are concentrated in cyclical uh, sectors like energy, financials, um, and industrials. And the question is, uh, not only how long can this continue, but um, were the, was the rest of the market uh, penalized? And so in terms of valuations, uh, if you look at the, this is the price over the five-year average earnings ratio from uh, a, a recent paper, um, you can see the value category, Citigroup, Exxon, uh, single-digit multiples of their average earnings over the last five years. And some of the growth stocks here, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, at um, massive multiples uh, to their recent income uh, over the last five years. And you could say, you know, this is the price you're paying basically for a dollar of corporate earnings averaged over the last five years. And trees cannot grow to the sky. These uh, growth stocks have had, uh, some of them have had very high earnings rates, growth rates, which makes them uh, good investments. But a good part of their appreciation has been just from people wanting to pay more for a dollar of corporate earnings uh, for the same fundamentals. And then here's another slide that shows these growth stocks or um, healthcare and tech stocks in general, uh, which are in that group versus energy and financials in the, in the mustard, uh, which comp, uh, compose the value universe. So you can see the um, uh, dominance of the growth stocks recently um, versus the value stocks and uh, you can see that these things run in patterns as well. And the last high in the, uh, I'm sorry, I misspoke, the healthcare and tech are in the mustard color. The, the peak, last peak was in the tech bubble. You can go back and see peaks like this in the go-go years in the late 60s and the nifty 50 and 73, right before 73, 74, and even in the tech stocks in the depression led by RCA among others. Uh, these patterns of technology booms and busts. Um, and then, uh, uh, the value sectors, which are are on their knees right now, um, uh, have their periods of outperformance too. So the question is, what would, should one do going forward? Should one bet uh, or, or emphasize their portfolio on these things which have run so hard or maybe look for some other ideas? And so Brandon was talking about how the breadth of the market had increased in this rally and um, uh, uh, growth had started out outperforming value in the uh, which you can see here uh, in the in the mustard colors are uh, large growth stocks and small growth stocks and in the blue are value which again are the industrials financials and energy uh, but since May 15th uh, there's been a turnaround where the value stocks uh, um, especially small value uh, are outpacing the growth stocks so maybe this is, this is a good sign for the rally that it's not just uh, a speculative play on those um, popular growth stocks, but the more of the market that participates in the rally, the more comfortable we can th feel that maybe it's not just a bear market bounce, maybe this is gonna stick. And then lastly, um, I have a slide here. This is from Bridgewater. And this slide talks about uh, each decade, the top performing stocks, what they were, um, they had to be in existence for that full 10-year period to make the list. 
what these stocks were and what their subsequent returns were relative to the market. So uh, in the 1970s, you can see on the, uh, uh, the, the, the high green returns and on the right, the subsequent 10 year returns, a lot of them are in red, but these returns are in reference to the market. They're not the actual returns for these stocks. So in aggregate, they, the, the popular stocks in the 70s trailed the markets in the 80s by 4%. And you see this effect in every decade. The winners uh, don't do as well, uh, even as the broad market in subsequent market periods typically. The only exception to this rule uh, has been Apple, which was a best performer in the 2000s and then again in the 2010s. But other than that, there haven't been any repeats from decade to decade. And so um, those are the, these are those stocks that I listed before are in this group and are leading the charge right now. They're very expensive. And uh, it is our opinion that that's not the way we want to focus uh, going into the future. So to our, uh, we have not just felt that way this year. We've felt that way for the past few years. Um, and so we have actually tilted away from those stocks and it's hurt our performance a little bit. Uh, but this is a movie we've seen many times before in history that um, the popular stocks run. You can never know how far they're going to run because they are the stocks people want to invest in. Uh, they have good stories and narratives behind them, but oftentimes they get very far away from their underlying fundamentals. Um, and so it's a tough job for us um, as a long term investor for our clients uh, to maintain portfolio positions that aren't necessarily um, confirmed in the news or the media uh, in the in every news bite that comes along uh, and, and, and perhaps even uh, denigrated. Uh, and so but those are tip, sometimes the types of investments that going forward are the ones that will uh, uh, do better in the marketplace. And I'll show you some support for that as we go on. Um, Someone wanted us to talk about, one of the clients wanted us to talk about a little bit, um, you know, what happened in the downturn and what's happening in the upturn. And to talk to talk about that a bit, we're gonna look at a, a model that comes out of, you know, basic finance. And it defines an investment as the, uh, today's value of future investment or cash benefits you get from that investment. So this looks at the stock market. So cash returns to us are dividends over time. And this is looking from the perspective of the S&P 500, the whole market, not an individual stock. So uh, last year, the dividends were $58.41, so to speak. Um, and uh, we are saying that dividends will grow at a historical rate of 5.2% a year. And we will discount them back to the present using a discount rate of 72 so if we go over here, you can see the dividends are increasing every year by that 5.2. And the value to us this year as an investor of those future dividends, you can see they decrease uh, because they're not, um, uh, we're discounting them back at an interest rate, which is higher than the growth rate. And then you add them all together uh, to get the value of the market. And what you see is that two thirds of the stock market value priced in today is due to earnings more than 20 years into the future. So the earnings just from the next few years are less than 6% of the anticipated value to investors of dividends, uh, future dividends from the market. So this is really kind of an amazing result. We spend so much time, so much sturm und drang over every little unpredictable bit of news out of the markets or uh, in, in the financial media over, is there gonna be a recession, a downturn? What about this sector, that sector? When they really in the long, big picture don't mean that much. What we really wanna focus on is the, is the engine that produces this okay. Uh, we, we can be reasonably sure that this is gonna go up over the long run. And what we wanna be careful of things that will impair these cash flows in a big way in the future. Um, and so this is the, the ball we want to keep our eyes on for the future because the short-term events, uh, one of the questions that were sent into us were, will the market be in the next three, six, 12 months? And the answer is, we don't know. 
Um, nobody knows that. And nobody in the media who has written a book or anywhere has ever gotten famous for being able to predict things at that granular level uh, over any period of time. Uh, that person does not exist and has not existed. So rather than do that, a stock and a bond, they're long in real estate are all long-term investments. Uh, we want to keep an eye on uh, the long-term cash generating nature of them uh, because we're committing money we're not really not going to need for at least five, preferably 10 or more years into the future. Um, so uh, a little bit on what the market was forecasting um, in the downturn, uh, we could either say uh, the, the, the market bottom in March to what, what would have to have happened in those future dividends uh, to justify the price it dropped down to. Well, if you just penalize earnings growth or dividend growth, uh, the price in the bottom would, would have justified to make it work. You'd have to have seven years of no earnings growth. Or let's say if we cut dividends to zero, how many years of that would we need to have seen to justify the drop uh, we saw in early March? And it would have been like four years of dividends at zero, plus we forego all the dividend growth in those four years. And that would have got us uh, using this model to the prices we saw on March 23rd. These are humongous events that we've um, really never seen before. Uh, and uh, accepting perhaps a depression, one of these scenarios. And um, they were uh, suggested to us that the market reaction in March was way, way too severe. And the other thing is that markets typically come back before the peak of bad news. And here are some of the reasons on the left while this market uh, may have gone up so quickly. First of all, the COVID uh, pandemic is a definable event of knowable, well, somewhat knowable duration. It's going to, uh, has, it has a beginning and an ending, although we're not quite sure where the ending is. Uh, there'll be a rebound in economic activity, the stimulus I mentioned, lower commodity prices, um, a rebound from the steep uh, market decline. And though we don't know uh, a lot about COVID, we know a lot more than when we started uh, of where we are. And so you can see, Markets typically peak before a downturn in economic activity, and they typically start to rebound before the bottom in the economic activity. So you hear a lot of bad news. It may sound like the world's ending, and all of a sudden, like this in this market rally, things start to go up um, and uh, keep going up. And sometimes it's a false alarm. Some of the bear markets have sizable rallies, but, uh, but then they continue to go down. Um, but this one is broad-based. And uh, frankly, a lot of the market participants uh, have not yet engaged in it. There is a lot of uh, potential out there for more investors. So going forward, one of the things we've done is collect uh, capital market assumptions of what uh, in uh, major investment firms and houses and investment banks think returns are going to be over the next seven to 10 years. Um, uh, and these were generated uh, during or post COVID. And I'm going to uh, skip over to just the equities here because this is a result we've been seeing for the last few years. Um, uh, it has, a, on average, from these uh, prognosticators, which include uh, uh, J.P. Morgan and BlackRock and um, research affiliates some pretty big firms, uh, in, on average, they expect a return from the S&P type stocks of about 5%. Same thing for small cap. And you can see the above the variations in the in individual forecasts. There's quite a range of for big caps, minus 1.4 all the way up to 7.8. Uh, foreign equities are forecast at 6.6, .6, which is a sizable increase over the US. Uh, our portfolios are tilted toward foreign equities and as they are toward emerging market equities away from the US right now. And that hurt us uh, la uh, last year and early this year um, relative to markets. But you can see from these expectations, we're not alone in believing that foreign and emerging markets, especially, the uh, will, are expected to have higher returns over the next 10 years than domestic markets. And then we have some information on valuations uh, based on the last 10 years of earnings averaged. Uh, you're paying about $27 for a dollar 
corporate earnings in the U.S. and much less outside the U.S. Um, and this is a, a chart that shows things on a more regional basis between uh, the U.S. Um, uh, EM on the far left, Europe and Asia. And you can see in uh, Europe and Asia, I'm sorry, the emerging markets, the cost of a dollar of corporate earnings uh, averaged over the last 10 years is about half of what it is in the U.S. Uh, so that is part of the reason some of these foreign markets are expected to return more than the U.S. And here's a historical range of those val that valuation metrics, uh, metric, the CAPE, um, and it shows that the top line here is the U.S., which has dominated all the others over the last five or six years. But you can see in the past, there have been times when the EM has, have dominated the U.S. Um, and uh, the Pacific in the big Japan bubble. Here's the TMT bubble. The players change hands over time. And whatever markets are dominating uh, are not necessarily the ones that will be dominant in the future. And this divergence of the U.S. market is a, this measure is again how much am I paying for a dollar of corporate earnings averaged over the last 10 years shows that a large part of the U.S. market return dominance is due to um, price outperformance uh, versus these other markets, not necessarily fundamentals like earnings and dividends. And so these are the trailing returns as opposed to the valuation. And here on the top, you can see the U.S. has been dominant over the last few years. Uh, but before that, it was EM markets. And before that, it was uh, Europe. And before that, it was Asia. And so these players change hands. And if you go out to the 20 year trailing returns, you can see that based on the last 20 years, emerging markets actually have the highest return, which would surprise a lot of people, um, followed by the US and then Asia and Europe bring up the rear. And so, um, if, if we were looking at a situation so dominant for the U.S. like this over the last 10 years, over the last 20 years, the EM were dominant, something must have happened in the, in the first 10 of those 20 years. And indeed, here's what happened in terms of some of the um, uh, foreign exposures, uh, as well as um, size and value as denominated in uh, dimensional advisors funds. So this is from 2000 to 2009. An investor would have experienced a 1% negative return per year for 10 years and watched these things uh, in foreign markets and size and value, almost the opposite of what's happened these last 10 years. So I'm showing this not predicting that this is what's going to happen over the next 10 years, but I expect a, a cousin of this to happen. I expect the foreign investments and the size and value to show up much bigger than they have in these last few years of dollar dominance and U.S. growth stock dominance. And just for fun, here are trailing 20-year returns on a lot of different asset classes, not just stocks. And uh, the dominant return belongs to real estate investment trusts or commercial real estate uh, of various kinds. But lo and behold, the second best asset class is gold. Gold has outperformed the S&P 500 over the last 20 years. Now, we're not at all predicting gold's going to do that. We hold gold in our portfolios because for things that we may not have experienced yet, like COVID or civil unrest or, or something else we may not have been thinking of, or unexpected inflation. So we sincerely hope the conditions do not arise that will make gold a better investment, but we hold it because we don't know the future. Uh, but here it is over the last 20 years, it's outperformed all the world's stock markets. The last point I wanted to get into is uh, in response to some other questions we've gotten and, um, you know, about uh, not not just COVID, but the response in 2008 as well. Um, how are we going to pay for all the fiscal and monetary stimulus and what might be the consequences? So I'm going to spend just a few more minutes, a few minutes on this. We're just running out of time. Um, we're going to cover more of this in future webinars. So right now I'm going to talk about the debt. And I'm going to talk about our debt right now, where it's projected to grow. And um, in history, there are some precedents for lowering government debt. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those and the conditions that engendered those. So right now, pre-COVID, I don't have post-COVID numbers yet, but these are the CBO projections of spending and income uh, pre-COVID 
um, going into the future. And you can see expenditures right now are about 21% of GDP. They're going up, projected to go up. That's mostly because of the two entitlements, Social Security and Medicare. But it's set about 21% of our economy right now. And taxes are down to about 16.8 from a long-term average of just under 18. I'm sorry, 16.3. And so this gap is the federal deficit. Now we've just piled uh, a couple trillion dollars at least of spending on this, not to mention the, the monetary stimulus, and there's more coming. So post COVID, this differential, at least for the next year or two is gonna be much wider. Um, and here's a projection of the net federal debt. So the net federal debt is the amount of federal debt that's owed to outside other government entities. The total government debt is not just 80% of GDP, it's closer to 110 or 108, uh, but let's just work with the net for now. But the projection speaks for itself. And again, this doesn't count the debt that'll be run up to finance the COVID spending. But it, the picture speaks for itself, it's just gonna be worse that we're on a track right now um, to exceed the debt levels in all the world wars, the civil war, uh, et cetera. So this is a, a problem. This is how we're gonna pay for it. And um, it's not just, you can't just blow it off and say, well, interest rates are really low or, or near zero right now, so it's not a problem. Uh, you know, it's like we're one or 2% we're paying on government bonds, depending on the maturity. And uh, John Cochran from, uh, uh, Hoover just ran an article on we should start issuing um, uh, uh, bonds with unlimited maturity uh, perpetuities to lock in low financing rates. And he's right because, you know, whether you're issuing 10, 20 or 30 year bonds, at some point you have to refinance them and it, uh, they'll come due and you have to reborrow the money and you'll be at the mercy of whatever the interest rates are in that period. So there's a tremendous amount of interest rate risk in this future debt. Uh, so going forward, the British ran into this problem uh, when they were financing the Napoleonic Wars, among other wars. Uh, being an empire means you're fighting a global empire, means you're fighting a lot of global wars, and they indeed did that, including our Revolutionary War. Um, but they managed to get the debt as a percentage of their economy down right before, right in time for World War I, um, and they did that through... Uh, spent controlling their spending and they let the growth of the economy grow faster than the debt grew and that reduced the debt burden as a percentage of gdp so they had the economic power of the empire to grow uh, they kept the lid on spending and they were gradually able to reduce that debt just in time to ratchet it up for world war one and then world war ii and then they repeated the same uh, process um, uh, uh, in after the war. So for the U.S., um, we did that after World War II as well. In a decade, we lowered the debt from a little over 100 percent to uh, uh, 43, 44 percent of the economy. And, and, and funny, that's the average debt level in the emerging markets, by the way. Um, that may be surprising, but on average in emerging market countries, uh, uh, the government debt burden is in the low 40s. Um, and uh, that was that was lowered all the way through the Carter years, uh, uh, the four, uh, Nixon, Ford, and Carter years. And then it started to trend up in the Reagan years. So it's going to be rocketing up here um, uh, post-COVID. And uh, the current administration, obviously, is not averse to piling on more debt at the peak of an economic cycle. Um, the danger to us, uh, or, or actually a benefit to us, has been interest burdens don't always track debt levels. But so because interest rates have dropped so much, the cost of carrying the debt has uh, dropped as well, even though we've increased debt. But that game's over. We can't lower interest rate rates much more. So the burden of servicing that debt is going to start going up as the debt goes up. Um, so what are our chances to reenact what the British did and what we did to lower the debt burden, uh, because right now we're spending, def we're spending money that's going into debt that our kids, grandkids, and people that aren't even born yet are going to have to pay in service. So we're actually pulling consumption, their consumption, forward for our benefit. 
And so here's how the post-war period looked. Uh, here's how they did it. And I'm going to go over to these columns uh, that show outlays and receipts. And you can see outlays were not that much different from today. They were, you know, ranged from 14 to 21 percent. Um, not, you know, right now we're 21-ish. And you, the 19 and 20 here that are so much higher than the other years were for the Korean War, a little bit of boost there. And the receipts were about what they are, a little higher than what they are now. Um, ranging from 14 to 19 percent a year in tax receipts. And you can see these track pretty close. And so the growth in the GDP, um, we, did, we did really didn't add to the debt. So if the, if the economy grows, the, the debt burden on the economy shrinks, and that's all there was to it. Uh, so what are our odds of reenacting that? Well, um, Eisenhower enacted a program of um, kind of pro-business policies, deregulation, uh, uh, low taxes, things like that. But he also had guys coming home from the war. Uh, they came home, formed families, had babies. Uh, so you had families in their peak um, earning and spending years with families. So the demographic, you had this huge demographic surge post-war. We don't have that right now. And you had this policy of keeping the budget under control so the growth in the economy would reduce the debt burden. So right now we know the current administration tip clearly isn't in that camp because we have a, a huge pre-COVID, we had a huge budget deficit. Um, at the peak of an economic cycle, you know, 10 years into a recovery. So we know the uh, current administration, uh, party in power uh, was historic, you know, uh, at least over the last 20, 30, 40 years was uh, budget balancing was at the top of their list of preferences. That's no longer the case, uh, at least for now. And so we know that the current administration is not going to help. What about the alternative? Well, unfortunately there, uh, the uh, JP Morgan compiled the Biden platform and he's proposed about $4 trillion in new taxes along the way. And unfortunately the spending proposed is six trillion. So we're looking at um, even higher deficits, um, even with taxes increased uh, with the opposition party coming in the current election. So there's really, um, things don't look good for solving the debt problem uh, in, in that regard. So um, I think I'm gonna finish up here and pass it on to Brandon to answer uh, another question that's been asked by our clients. So just as a reminder, as we wrap up some of our prepared slides, uh, you can use the chat feature to ask any questions or leave any comments. So one question that we got um, submitted beforehand was why we should hold cash in our portfolios. And if 2020 is, is any reminder, uh, life can throw us really wicked curveballs. Um, I'm not a baseball fan, but I think Barry Zito had a pretty wicked curveball, uh, San Francisco giant pitcher. So there, I'm sure going forward, there'll be times in our lives where we have to draw on our cash and maybe even more than we were expecting. And the last thing we really want to do is to dip into our investments that are supposed to be held for the longer term, like stocks or even some bonds. So that's one reason why we at least have a, a few percentage, um, few percent of the portfolio in cash. And then uh, another reason is that when we see markets go down uh, 30, 40 percent like we did earlier this year, uh, that enables us to rebalance into those really hard hit uh, assets. Um, it's, it's especially when bonds were pretty um, expensive and spreads were tight and valuations in equity markets, especially the US were, were so um, high after such a long uh, bull market, maybe it's a good idea to keep a little bit more cash on hand. Thanks, Brandon. I um, think at this point, 
like to thank you all for your attention. And we uh, will keep going for a few minutes here. We have some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, so the first one um, talks about uh, uh, real estate and how the um, with, with the experience, positive experiences uh, many companies have had worked with people working from home. What does that mean for commercial real estate? Uh, so I have a, the conversations every day about this with either business owners um, or uh, real estate investors. And the answer is um, uh, the work at home experience has been quite a success. Uh, people have been more productive than expected across the board pretty much. Uh, and, the, and the employees doing it have been more comfortable than expected. So one could reasonably expect that uh, there'll be more of this kind of activity in the future. Um, there are proposals out there from completely reworking offices and workspaces of the future um, and uh, greatly reducing space all the way down to just modifications at the, uh, to existing firm infrastructure, which would enable uh, more of a hot desking concept where a lot of people are working from home but spend some time in the office and, and exchange desks. So like uh, we don't, the answer to the question is it will have an impact on commercial real estate. And some of the proponents are saying it will have a large impact. Now we're just talking about office here um, predominantly, but it would, could also affect medical and some other uh, sectors. Um, but it will most definitely have some sort of impact on the amount of space required. Um, I personally don't think it's going to be a disaster. If 9-11 was any indication, we made a lot of changes around security, security protocols, but life largely went back to normal after that. And I think there'll be changes, some economic consequences, but I don't think we're going to be in looking at these humongous uh, office reorientations as some of the pundits are talking about. Uh, another question, uh, tech stocks just hit an all-time high, how much further they can go? Well, I, I think I answered most of that, um, not much higher, uh, and, but we've thought that for the last few years. And like in the tech bubble or in the go-go years in the 60s, you know, go-go years, if you had uh, Tron in the name of the company, it, it got an extra boost in the stock market. Um, th these things can go on and on where valuations can get really um, uh, untethered from underlying fundamentals and things uh, could go a lot further from today, but I can't, as a fiduciary, put my client's money at risk in companies like that, at least in an overweighted basis. So um, uh, I would be a, a seller right now to answer the question and I would be looking at other things. So if you look at sectors like the energy sector, uh, especially are the material sectors, which are um, at, uh, well, at the bottom, or at prices that we hadn't seen before um, the companies in terms of uh, uh, their earnings um, since the 80s, um, I can buy uh, these companies that will do better when uh, the uh, there's an economic recovery. But if I, going back to my last topic, um, if this debt buildup and the spending buildup, you know, one of the ways you can cure debt is inflation. You can grow the economy, part of it being inflation and lower your debt burden that way. Well, investing in some of these uh, resource-based companies or real estate, uh, per the other question, um, these things are sensitive to unexpected inflation and typically do better. So I can, I can buy those right now at bargain basement prices. And so I would be lightening on my tech stock positions and doing just that. And that's something we've actually, that we've actually done. Um, another question is, did we expect the rapid recovery in equities that we've seen from the March lows? And the answer is no and yes. Um, we, we expected a recovery. Uh, we didn't necessarily expect it would be so soon, nor so violent on the upside. Um, and the jury's out. Uh, we could still be looking at a bear market rally. That's, that's not atypical in market down drags like this. But uh, what we're seeing in terms of the breadth um, and a lot of the institutional world has not yet committed to increasing their equity uh, um, allocations. Um, you know, they haven't even joined the party yet and they are suffering because they missed out. 
Uh, and uh, so this could have a long way to go yet. So no, we didn't, we, we thought there'd be an, uh, a recovery. Um, I talked in the last client seminar about a possible melt up because all the stimulus is gonna be hitting about the time the economy is recovering. And so we're seeing a melt up right now. Um, but there's still a lot of sectors and world markets that are lagging the big part of the recovery. <clears throat> uh, let's see, I've got a couple others here. Um, what do we attribute the uh, market increase to? And I think I had a little bit of a slide on that um, going back. But you, you've got a number of um, uh, factors involved with the market recovery. Um, you've got the extent of the decline. You've got uh, an economic re rebound where you're going to have to have uh, a recovery of part of the consumption that was lost. So you'll have a recovery with a recovery of foregone consumption on top of that. You'll have a massive wall of fiscal stimulus hit and probably another one that they're talking about right now that'll be enacted on top of that. You have a great lowering of price, energy prices, oil prices, which are a primary determinant of transportation costs. You have a lowering of other commodity prices. Um, and then if you look across at market participants, um, retail stock investors have been investing in this um, on an ongoing basis um, uh, in, in the market. Uh, wealthy individuals have been selling. Most of the rest of the public is buying, but big uh, commodity pools, risk parity pools, big, big institutional pools that risked down as the market was going down have not yet committed, uh, uh, recommitted to the equity markets in large part. Uh, there's a lot of fuel left there to keep a rally driving. And of course, um, economic fundamentals, um, uh, as they improve, will also have fuel. And frankly, a lot of the markets around the world were inexpensive going into the downturn and were made even more so. So there's a lot of possible returns abroad from the recovery, from earnings increases, from rebounds in currencies uh, that are available um, for the taking out there. Uh, I think um, we've had some questions about the presidential elections. You know, how are we going to pay for the stimulus, which I addressed a little bit here today. Um, and then uh, I have another question in on modern monetary theory. So we just have a few minutes left. So what I'm going to do is we intend to have another webinar where we're actually going to talk about the election and the effect of historical, uh, what we've seen in historical presidential elections um, and what, what we might look forward to on platforms and the other issues of, you know, how, how I'll continue to talk about how are we going to pay for this and what are possible medium and long-term consequences of the interventions, not just COVID or, but 2008 and nine. And then the idea of uh, modern monetary theory, um, which might be a session all in and of itself. Uh, we'll do that in, in the future. So, I wanted to thank you all for spending some time with us today, and I hope you keep yourselves and your families safe and prosperous through this very uncertain and crazy time. And as always, we're there for you. If you have any questions you wanna ask, uh, feel free to contact your team at Versant or even uh, you can contact me directly and I'd be happy to spend some time with you. Thank you so much. <laughs>